Willie Jones Jr. was what every parent dreams their child will grow up to be. Raised in a strong family in Southeast San Diego, he excelled in everything he did through a combination of talent, intelligence, and dogged determination. His all-around excellence was legendary here at Lincoln Preparatory High School and citywide, and everyone who knew him saw his energetic ambition balanced with incredible kindness and compassion. Willie wanted to become a doctor and had received an academic scholarship to Cornell University. He was ready to go there in three days when his life was ended tragically as an innocent bystander. He was 18 years old. The effects of Willie's death are still being felt in this community, but the fact is this could have happened just about anywhere. It's a story being repeated all across America where the nightmare of youth violence is killing our children, grieving our families, and crippling the future of our communities. For the sake of all our kids, the story of Willie James Jones Jr. is one that has to be told and one that must be acted upon. I would say that Willie, above and beyond any student I ever had, maximized his potential. He had a value system about him that he was not going to compromise, that, 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 guide, that guided him through life. It was a foundation laid by the church, his parents, family, and others. He was a kid that uh, was going to be able to do anything he wanted to do, and he knew he was going to be a success. I don't think I've ever had a student that worked harder, and that says a lot since he had so much stuff to do. Uh, time management has been very important. And you're also a tutor? Yes, at Choice Elementary School. Um, it's a it's a program designed to tutor uh, young boys who aren't doing so well in school. Willie did very well in school, earning a 3.97 academic grade point average, serving as student council president and president of all high school student council organizations in the city, captain of the wrestling team and state wrestling finalist three years in a row. He was listed in who's who among American high school students, and even with all his commitments, Willie was active as an Aaron Price Fellow, a program begun by Saul Price in memory of his son, Aaron, who died of cancer. I go and I say, hey, what's, I'm an Aaron Price Fellow. They say, what's an Aaron Price Fellow? <laughs> it brought students from, I believe, 16 high schools and San Diego City schools together, and its main focuses are to expose the kids to careers and to how the government and the city works, as well as to bring kids together from different communities to form friendships. He had an amazing way of balancing school and his social life and all of his responsibilities and kept them all juggled. And I never really knew how, but always giving as much time as was needed to the different activities that he was involved in. He could operate in all arenas and it made everybody feel comfortable no matter where it was. Matter of fact, I wish I could do some of the things that he did. Example, he and I went to a couple of meetings together. You know, you think he was running for office or something. I mean, it's just like everybody knew him. I mean, he was that kind of person. When you talk, you hear the old cliche about people not knowing a color, don't see a color line. It's like he didn't see one. I mean, he didn't let anybody stop him. He moved straight ahead. He was friendly. Everybody liked him. That smile, if you didn't feel like smiling, by the time you look at his, you know, big, broad smile, I mean, you find something to smile about. You know, I mean, he was just that way. I mean, and, and, and like I say, the most interesting part, it wasn't phony, it was for real. I felt real comfortable having Willie as a student, uh, as a friend, and I knew he was going to be uh, a good doctor. He would have had a great bedside manner with his uh, personality. Willie's parents were proud of their son's accomplishments and his desire to give back to his community. He looked at people as being just one whole family. And, um, and I think that's why uh, so many people love him everywhere. He would talk to different schools. He would uh, volunteer and go to uh, the elementary school. He started that at probably ninth grade. And he continued through 12th grade. And he would preach college to them. His whole words was, you can do this doesn't matter where you come from, you can do it. A lot of it came from my mom. My mom is a really motivated woman, and she's always, and I've followed her example a lot. Hard work brings success. He felt 
it was very important to get accepted to an Ivy League school and to do it coming from a community school to show other kids that it's possible. It's not where you're at, it's what you're doing. He wanted me in high school to complete my assignments, you know, to go to class, to, you know, wrestle, to, you know, to do ASB. And most importantly, he knew that I wanted to become a cop. And so he really pushed, you know, what are you doing towards, you know, going and becoming a cop? What are you doing? Did it? He kept harassing me almost. And his goal for me was, you know, to become the best person that I could be. During my 20s, you know, I dated different guys and I'd always bring them home to meet my parents and um, Willie would just sit him down and, you know, have his little checklist and, you know, he's just like this high school kid and, um, you know, I didn't mind but I'm sure the guys felt a little uncomfortable and he'd, he'd drill him, you know, um, what do you plan on doing and what are your intentions with my sister and they'd answer because they knew, you know, they couldn't disrespect him or treat him like a kid because I probably wouldn't go out with him again. Well, you know, I had the best of, of both worlds. I, I, had a, I had a good son, and then I had a son who was an outstanding athlete. Willie's father had the unique opportunity of being able to teach his son on the mat as a wrestling coach at Lincoln. Our first years, our first, my freshman year, that it was a big, it was kind of tough, actually, because he's really critical. It takes um, a special child or a special athlete to to go into this particular sport. A lot of the people who are in the stands are prone to ridicule you and you get beat or you get twisted this switch away. So therefore a number of kids will shy away if they're not successful immediately. A true champion has to understand his defeat before he is a true champion. And Willie was an individual that never gave up. Things are never given to you in a silver platter. You gotta earn it and Willie earned it. Every bit that he took part and participate in, the hard sweat, the pain, the agony was there. And I could see it in his dad when there are times when he lost, when he should have never lost. And there are times when he won, it was like he was on top of the world. Everybody looked up to him. Everybody wanted to be like him. When they couldn't, he came down to their level and said, hey, I'll show you how to do it. And that, to me, was I felt he learned, he was able to give back what I taught him. He was wrestling well enough by the middle of his 10th grade career that we were starting to be recruited by major universities. They were sending letters. People were coming out to observe him. By his senior year, Willie was considering athletic scholarship offers from several universities but the promise of a full academic scholarship from Cornell and a spot on his wrestling team proved irresistible to the young honor student. School is equally important, if not more so. Uh, sports have always been a place to uh, relieve stress, the stress that school puts on you, and have a little bit of fun while you do it. But school it will always be there, knowledge. He had such a thirst for knowledge, and. Um, knowledge just was so um, important to him that I think that going to Cornell was just the beginning for him. It was just the stepping stone to get to greater things. Before I begin, I would first like to thank my family for all your love and support, my lifelong friends, Eugene, Tomiko, and Victor, and most importantly, my mom. You've been my backbone when I thought I had no more strength. He wanted to come back into his community and help the people that he had left here. That was his ultimate goal. He wanted to set up clinics as a doctor, but he wanted to set them up for people that uh, couldn't afford medical. You know, he thought about that. When he said he wanted to be a doctor and said it from the beginning, it was truly believable because that was his personality anyway, one of caring, one for, of doing for others and achieving. And he always said that if I could make a difference, I would give my life. We will look back to this graduation day and realize how memorable this is. ASB President Willie Jones <laughs> Willie's mother, Rose, had always been protective of her son, even when Willie was invited to a party at the home of a friend on graduation night. There's just a lot of things we did say no to. At the end, 
I felt that he just deserved a little fun, you know? And this was only three hours, and it was structured. Of course, if it was left up to me, I probably would have locked him <laughs> anywhere. He wouldn't even go to school, <laughs> you know? Because I always thought even at school, something could happen. Eugene Michael Grant. We did not go to house parties. We did not go to game parties. But being that Darcel was a real close friend, and he, was, he told us that the only way you were going to get into the party was by bringing your tassel, we thought it would be safe. And so my him, myself, and my girlfriend all went to the party together. He came pick my girlfriend and I up. And we went there, and we was real excited. We had a great time at Darcel's party. It was well chaperoned. It was a lovely evening besides what happened. Homeowner Mary Sharp had gone to great lengths to assure a safe party for her son Darcel and his friends. There was no alcohol present, and adult chaperones, including an off-duty police officer, screened the partygoers to prevent any trouble from gang members who might try to crash the party. What I know and what my husband know of gays, we thought they, uh, the way they dress, the, the dickies, the colors, the way they wear their hair, you, you can spot them. And it used to be you could, but now they're able to blend in. And so you don't know who's a gang member anymore. One kid that did come to the party, I had heard he was affiliated with the gang. And I asked my son to ask him to leave because if one come, more would follow. And as soon as I asked him to do that, I seen this child leave. So I thought I had done what I, you know, needed to do. That's all I knew. During the party, we was laughing and dancing with the girls, and we were just, and we really wasn't really focused on, you know, who else was in. I mean, there, there were a couple of gang members in the party, but it wasn't like a, a threat that we thought we should leave. And so, you know, we, we left at the end of the party because they respected us and we respected them. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, I, I didn't, I, it never dawned on me that something like this to happen. I didn't even know what it was. But since I never heard it before, I knew what it had to be. We was all gonna go to Denny's. And so I was going to go find a lady friend for um, Willie. And then as I was going back into the house, that's when I just heard like firecrackers. It seemed like firecrackers. It was just loud, loud noise, loud noise. And Willie had said, Gene, and I was like, I thought he was just calling my name to just get down on the ground. And that's... But he had been hit. Willie's Aunt Celia was among the first no of his relatives either. to reach Mercy the Hospital. Uh, the lady at the hospital said he didn't make it. And I said, he didn't make it? What do you mean he didn't make it? She said, he didn't make it. He's dead. I said. He can't be dead. He's always done everything he wanted to do. And dying at that point in life wouldn't have been his choice. So it was unfathomable to me that he didn't make it. It just didn't cross my mind. I knew, I knew in my gut that Willie was gone. I didn't want to believe it, but I knew it. You know, a lot of things came back to my mind. 
and most especially is how I always, from the time when he was a little boy, would, would, would try to instill in him to always be the best and try to be first in this and try to be first in that. And then I thought about, here he was, one of the first in his class, and then the first technically to graduate, and then the first to die. I just thought about how valuable first was, you know. Messages on the news about uh, Willie's uh, being shot, and it just made it, you know, to this day, it was just like the weirdest day of my life, um, toughest day of my life. Man, it just, you know, it was just too much for all of us, you know. And um, I just remember feeling so completely overwhelmed and feeling like I should not be doing this. This is not what should be happening right now. I should not be picking out the clothes that he has to be buried in. I should not have to sit down and think of times of when he was small and for an obituary. I should not have to be talking to people about his life and his death. I should not have to be doing this right now. What we should be doing is packing up all the gifts that we just got him to go to college, the iron and the little coffee maker and the computer, you know? And, um, and the graduation gifts, you know? I'm giving him my speeches and, you know, that's what I should be doing as his big sis. But I shouldn't be burying my little brother. More than 1,500 people stood overflowing at Bayview Baptist Church for the funeral of Willie Jones, Jr. Attending dignitaries included the mayor of San Diego, city council members, and friends from all over San Diego and the nation. I remember reading in the Bible at one point when I was very angry about his death and very angry at God about taking him so early and reading a passage that read something like, um, having fulfilled the achievements of a long career, his soul was pleasing to the Lord and therefore he sped him out of the midst of wickedness but the people saw and did not understand. Early on, there were no clear suspects in Willie's murder, but evidence began to point to the O'Farrell Park Gang, rivals to the Lincoln Park Gang on whose turf the shooting had occurred. Some cases are more solvable than others. Now, this case was solvable because of who committed the crimes. The people that committed these crimes were people that were involved in other criminal activity. One name that kept coming up in the investigation was Delano Wright. Police enlisted the help of former San Diego gang member Darren Henderson to spring a trap. Now I heard about the Willie Jones case and, and uh, you know, it was a, it was a trip because, you know, I, I never knew, I'm saying, no kids, no kid had a scholarship, no the medical school. Come on now, in the hood, now where, you know, where did he go to school at? And, you know, you kind of thinking, I'm saying, yeah, press just putting extras on. You know, they trying to blow the kid up. Probably was one of them on Lincoln Park Bloods, you know. And, and basically, you know, that's how we think, you know, because you don't, you don't see kids like that in the hood. And so I started, man, it was like the, the case just stuck to me. A meeting was arranged between Darren Henderson and Delano Wright at a San Diego hotel. There, Henderson posed as a big-time Las Vegas drug dealer, seeking a new San Diego supplier. I told Delano about some crimes I did. Told him I didn't like Lincoln Park, I didn't like the green guys, you know, because, you know, they had shot at my brother. And he told me he hated them too, and, but he told me they really hated him because, you know, he ended up killing, you know, a little kid over there in the area. He didn't actually name Willie, but he, he made references to the incident. It's a year, it's a year later now. I know who did what. 
y'all know who did what. I'm in the car now. I told you guys I was in the car. Is that the truth? Delano Wright was brought in for questioning. He initially denied any involvement, then finally admitted riding in the car and supplying the gun, but claimed fellow O'Farrell Park gang member Kenny Martin had been the trigger man. After initial indictments against three suspects in November 1995, a new round of indictments naming four suspects was filed in May 1996. Accused of the murder of Willie Jones were Delano Wright, Kenneth Martin, Ricky Hill, and Eric McCartney. Not indicted was the car's driver, Myron Mason, who pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter in return for his testimony. Willie Jones Sr. had previously known Delano Wright when he had coached him on Lincoln's football team a few years earlier. He wasn't there for the duration of the season, but he was there for a short period of time on the team. Uh, he had some academic problems. It was never that I can remember rude behavior or acting out. I watched kids and I knew that he had that type of character to be able to. But, you know, I never saw anything that would have led me to believe that this would have happened. All of the guys' demeanor in the courtroom was just like totally, you know, nonchalant. They were like, oh yeah, okay, you know, just gang members who really tried to act, you know, really tough on TV. And it just didn't make sense to me how people could be so cold on a person and on a person's family and friends. Soon, three of the four defendants pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and assault charges in return for their testimony and having the murder charges dropped. Now only the accused trigger man, Delano Wright, faced a murder trial. As facts slowly emerged, it became clear that O'Farrell Park gang members Myron Mason, Dericky Hill, Eric McCartney and Kenny Martin had indeed attended the graduation party prior to the shooting. There, they saw rival gang members whom they suspected in the recent murder of one of their own. They see the person that they believe was involved in the killing of their friend, and then shortly after that, they leave the party because basically uh, the tension that's there and there's no alcohol. The four young men proceed to the home of Delano Wright and tell him what they've seen. So Delano says, what do you want to do? And Kenny says, bring your strap, which is a street term for a gun. So Delano goes in the backyard, comes back, gets in the car, and all five get in the car, and they drive back. Delano and Kenny walk to the corner and look around the corner, probably to scout out who was out, is the party done yet, et cetera. Well, it just happens that the, when they show up there, the party is letting out. They all get back in the car and they drive around the corner. As soon as they break the corner and start heading south on Ozark, Delano starts firing from the backseat of the car. Delano, I believe, based on the evidence that was presented in the trial, didn't intend to shoot Willie specifically, but there were definitely Lincoln Park gang members in and around Willie, and I think he just shot at this large group of people intending to kill whoever was there because after all that's good enough that's good enough for gang work no one deserves to have to go through this no other family should have to go through this you know and we've seen it so many times and we shouldn't see it this all it should be so simple to to devastate a family like this it shouldn't be so simple as like you're walking in the store to, to buy a can of soda that's how simple it is that's how often we see it I work with the court system. It's just a revolving door. They need to be locked up so that the families don't have to go through this, so that we're not sitting here doing interviews about this kind of thing. It shouldn't happen like I'm so afraid that they're going to slip through the crack, that we're going to have some technical problem, or you know, maybe the prosecution might make a technical error, and then they would walk. And I felt confident that these were the guys that were responsible. When I saw them, I knew that they were. Based on a plea bargain to the lesser charges of voluntary manslaughter and assault, Dericky Hill and Kenneth Martin were sentenced to 14 years in prison. Eric McCartney, 14 years, 8 months. You devastated my life forever. It took me two long years just to look at his picture. The agony that you caused is irreversible. 
and the life you took was irreplaceable. I was angry because I didn't expect them to get up and say, oh, I'm sorry, and, you know, we really didn't mean to do it. I didn't expect that, but I, I guess I expected to see, to see that they were sorry for what they did and for the pain that they caused. We the jury in the above entitled cause find the defendant, Delano Wartrell Wright, guilty. The shooter, Delano Wright, received 35 years to life after his conviction of first-degree murder. He wasn't a man then, he still isn't. Not once during the almost two hours that we've been here this morning has this coward had the nerve to turn around and look at us. I watched you throughout the whole trial, sitting there like a machine without emotions, like a beast without a soul. Delano, it takes a man to say I'm sorry. And it takes a fool just to walk away and just let it be. Because of his early cooperation and testimony in the case, the driver of the car, Myron Mason, was sentenced to seven years in prison. Because of me and others, you had to experience something that no family should have to face, the loss of a loved one to a sense of, a sense of violence. If I could change everything that has happened, especially the loss of your son, I would in a heartbeat. I felt like the guys that, you know, were a part of it didn't get enough time. I mean, Delano, I'm glad that, you know, he's a shooter. He's the one who did it. He got enough time. But then again, that's not bringing back my best friend. So I really, you know, the court is just all just, just the court, you know. No matter what sentence they got, my best friend's not never going to be able to see my kids. I'm not going to never be able to see his kids. And that's what kills me every day. The death of Willie Jones made San Diegans wonder what was happening to their city. And they wondered if there were any solutions to gang violence. From the law enforcement perspective, part of the solution can be found in the police department's gang suppression team. I would uh, say that the average person probably doesn't realize how many gang members are in their particular area. I don't think we'll ever get rid of them. I think that's realistic, but I think that uh, there's always the chance of, okay, we got something going on here. This guy's wanted right here. In my hood, we, did, we, we do felonies every day. The amount of crime that we do is amazing, and the amount of victims that fall in our path before we get caught is frightening. He's a documented gang member, and uh, he has fourth waiver status, which means he's uh, subject to search and seizure at any given time. And Meadowbrook and Skyline is the heart of all the bloods hanging out in Skyline. So we, we know this subject, and we know he's on fourth waiver. Wherever you got dope, you got guns. Wherever you got guns, you got shooters. And nine out of 10 times, man, the average person get shot in a drive-by. Don't be the person you shooting at. Okay, there's supposed to be a group of six to seven possible gang members hanging out, possibly ones armed with a gun. Apparently, according to mom, he's been coming home with ammo, with all kinds of other stuff, and she just, she can't even control him anymore. She says she doesn't even know if he's on probation. Okay, what's your last name? Nope. You're on probation? Nope. He did have the red rag hanging from his uh, rear pocket, so that's not, that's not a good sign. Depending on the color of the rag, in this case it was a red rag, so might indicate he's a blood, he's involved in a gang. Uh, a lot of times they'll have red shoes as well. In this case, he didn't. So all that tells us that maybe he's involved in gangs. My guess is that he is. The thing that makes San Diego so dangerous to just say the average, you know, African-American kid here is that, you know, the gangs here don't wear, they don't flag their colors. You can't just go to Skyline, you're gonna see dudes over there with red. Just like in Lincoln Park, you're gonna see dudes with green. In the hood, you're gonna see dudes with blue. But, uh, the real, I'm saying the real bangers, I'm saying real Chris like me. I ain't never sad, for real, you know, I ain't really never wore my hair braids or nothing. I was clean cut with a straight killer. And I'll fade you in a minute. You know, if you cross me, bam, you gone. That quick, you wouldn't think nothing else about it. You can't tell dudes from Skyline, from the dudes in the military, from dudes at San Diego State. 
you, you, you just you can't make the distinction. So, in a sense, you you start to form out that everybody black and young is a gang member. And that's kind of like how, you know, kids like Willie Jones get caught up in the mix of our book. If you understand the way this type of retaliation works, the, uh, there's no dishonor in shooting a young black male that's in the rival gang neighborhood, whether or not he's a gang member. It's not like they pull up and they say, hey, do you have your gang ID card on you? Can Let me establish that you're a gang member before I shoot you. No, they pull in the neighborhood, they see a guy, well, he generally fits the description. He's young, he's black, he has short hair. Um, hey, that's good enough for me, and they shoot him. Police depend heavily on individuals from the community to keep them informed about gang activity. They're the ones who are able to tell us where the gang members are hanging out, what crimes they're committing, what they're doing. I mean, they're the voice for the community. If they don't tell us, how are we going to know? We have an idea because we work in the area, obviously, but they're the ones who can tell us more. They live in the community. That's the only way the kids going to know. The only way the kids going to stop gang banging is if they knew the truth about what gang banging is all about. Game banging is about life in jail, straight up. I'm saying game banging is about going to film road, straight up. Game banging is about worrying about the police 24-7, stressing. Just from my personal experience, I grew up in a low-income area. Um, when I was a teenager, I knew a lot of gang members. I ch obviously chose to go the different path. This world, as we know, will never be the same. But it's our job, as a graduating class in 1994, to make sure it's a positive change. The monuments change, and history making change. It's gonna take kids like Willie Jones. Strong, cause I'm telling you, you gotta be strong to grow up in the hood and not join the gang, not commit crimes. You know, that's, that's where real strength comes from. Here, here was a person who was obviously gonna make a difference in this community, you know? And why don't we all just make a difference for him? Because everybody has potential, everybody has a skill, everybody, it doesn't matter who you are, everybody has a skill that they can offer the community. You gotta believe in yourself, and you gotta believe in God, and you will get there, there's no doubt about it. That's what got me there. I think that Willie's death impacted this whole community, state, nation. I think it impacted it because this was one of our best. We oftentimes refer to him on our campus, uh, kids do, you know, counselors do, and and, uh, and we want kids to try to emulate the, the values and the character and, and, and the drive and the determination. Just recently we had a cheerleader pageant and one of the young ladies in the pageant, when asked who one of her heroes was, was Willie. And uh, others chose their parents and chose, you know, other national kind of figures, but she chose Willie Jones because of what he stood for about education and hard work, and, and she wanted to use him as a role model for her life. He was my ASB president. I always wanted to be a president of something. Finally, my senior year, which is this year, I became senior class president. I worked closely with the ASB president and the ASB advisor, and all these things came out of um, things I saw with Willie James Jones because he could do all those things, keep his grades up too, and play sports and things of that nature. So he inspired me to go the extra mile for my school. After his death, I started thinking about things, and he, he was like a role model for the community. And so I saw that as a, a, something that pushed me to go in the direction that he went in. And today, I want to go out there and do something with my life and come back to my community to help those that need help. Mr. David Owens, would you please come up? Several academic and athletic awards have since been named in Willie's honor, including the Willie James Jones Jr. Memorial Scholarship Award given at Lincoln High School each year. I think that the potential for children to positively influence each other is highly underrated. You know, Willie inspired numerous people to make changes in their lives. Willie's a fallen hero. Uh, for young people and, and for and for and for others, not you know you know I, I think I would be wrong if I were to say he was he's just a a person for the for the teenager. I think he's one for all of us to really take note of. And and, and as uh, I heard his mother say one time that he was on loan to us, and so we should take a, a particular example, and as time gone, a, a particular delight in learning from some of the things that he stood for and that perhaps that he would have been.
I think he would be surprised by how much he impacted San Diego and a message that was, would have been important to him and why the renaming of that street was important to us. It wasn't about recognition for him. It was about the other children who were left behind. It was about them remembering that it's not how long you're here. It's what you while you're here. Willie is not the only student I've had that has been killed. I have students who, just like Willie, uh, were in the wrong place at the wrong time. If it takes somebody like Willie to get everybody's attention, that's a shame on us because it, it does happen on a yearly basis. But I think if God were going to pick someone to wake us up as to what's really happening in the community, it would be with Willie. Because, you know, we can all see that the loss of Willie was a waste to the nth degree. But even if it wasn't Willie, just one student loss is enough to be something that should rally us to do something about this. Youth violence uh, was a problem in the community. I know that during my tenure at the particular high school, there were probably at least four student deaths. I really didn't give it very serious thought because my children weren't involved in it. And I think that happens to many, many parents and that their children aren't involved. But yet, innocently, you can become a victim of the same violence. I've become more acutely involved and concerned because of our loss. She lost control, she dropped the ball. It starts in school a lot of times. But before that, it starts at home. These are the same people many times who 10 years from now will be our major gang members. Unless we can make a difference now. You're going into another stage of your life. You're coming into young adulthood. And you're going to have to start assuming some of those responsibilities for that. And i just like to say that it was a pleasure working with you this year. And I was really pleased, even though we had a few little spats. Uh, I still like you all. I want you guys to all have a good, safe summer. Be careful, and I love you all. Oh, hush, girl. I'm going to watch your speech as you go around the track. And keep it up. <laughs> That's why all of us have to be responsible, and we all are responsible. What ha for what happens with the children, because those children, those problem troubled children, grow up to be those problem troubled adults. Which is why we see so many kids on TV that we go, you know what, I'm not surprised. No, you're not surprised, but you should have tried to do whatever you could while the child was growing up. We've got to catch them. As we all say, it takes a village to raise a child. I think mostly important, it takes the immediate family to raise their children. <laughs> when kids kill and um, they do terrible things, it's like they feel nobody cared for me. Now, that doesn't say that I didn't have a teacher that cared. Um, you know, I didn't have other people out there that cared because there is loving people out One, there that two. will see a child and they will care. One, but what they're saying is that Family means a lot, and they don't seem to care. And because of that, it doesn't matter who else care out there. And because One, I'm hurting, two. I want to go out and hurt somebody else. When you have a child, take a look at them. Don't be so wound up into your schedule. Even your job is secondary. Your children are first because they can harm other children. They can become murderers, you know, uh, and you don't want that. When Willie was killed, we not only lost a great young man, 
we lost everything he would have become. And the five young men who murdered him, they were lost too. The death toll among our youth and their numbers in prison are staggering. That's why it's up to all of us to make sure the future belongs to kids like Willie. Beyond his death, Willie's life and accomplishments show all things are possible if we choose to make a difference. If I had a choice, would I not have wanted to experience this? With all the heartache and all the pain and the hurt, would I have chosen not to have had Willie in my life and been one of those people that says, I wish I would have known him? Then I thought, no. Throughout all of this, I'm still so, feel so blessed to have said he was a part of us. He's, he's our brother and he's a part of our family. Funding for this program was provided by Nancy and Robert Plaxico.